You're listening to the Vanu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. Visit our website for free resources to aid you in your pursuit of self-liberation, old Vanu publications, podcasts, guest articles, and much more. Go to vanupodcast.com. And now, your hosts, Shane and Jason. And welcome to the Vanu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to coercion. I'm your host, Shane. This podcast, everything found on the website, is covered by BIPCOTS and no government license. So allows reuse and modification to anyone except for governments and the agents thereof. Uh, learn more by visiting BIPCOT.org. Uh, so our crypto anarchism series continues today as I welcome back Smuggler, a covert communications expert and crypto anarchist uh, living the second realm life. Uh, hell, he uh, wrote the damn book on it, which you can pick up at libertyunderattack.com or for free at interplex.net. So uh, what's important is that you access the information. I don't care how you do it. Um, but if you like paperbacks, uh, we do have those. But uh, yeah, I had him on the podcast a few months back. Uh, that was episode number 53. Uh, if you haven't checked that out, please uh, make sure to do so. I've received a, received a ton of great feedback on it, and my recent guests um, all actually heard about the podcast through uh, my interview uh, with uh, with Smugglers. So that's uh, certainly great to hear. Get, uh, go check out that episode. So yeah, in recent months, the subject of cryptography bans has come up once again. Most recently here in the uh, USSA, the jo Dolan, uh, Dolan J. Trump administration has discussed banning encrypted messaging apps such as Signal or Wire. Uh, well, what do you know? Smuggler wrote uh, an extensive article on the subject back in October of 2017, which shares the same title as this episode, The Fog of Crypto War. I'll drop a link to it in the show notes. Uh, definitely go check it out. Uh, so to set the stage, let me read a couple of paragraphs from the introduction of the aforementioned article. Quote, over the last two years, politicians in the USA, UK, and elsewhere have been threatening the regulation of strong cryptography. But the experts and journalists who have expressed concern over this have done so, have done, done so in ways that we consider misleading. In this document, we'll recap the motives and strategies of the people who wish to regulate cryptography, the responses by its defenders, and the battle over public opinion. We will conclude that the picture painted in the media is misleading, as are those of experts and activists, and would lead us to resist a straw man while missing the issues of substance. Uh, so here, herein, we will discuss some of the possibilities the state has when it comes to regulating encryption, why most arguments against, uh, made against the banning of encryption are bad, and uh, what, impl uh, what impact governments could have on cryptography, uh, along with the implications for privacy advocates. Uh, so it's uh, sure to be a fun one. Without further ado, Smuggler, welcome back to the Vanu podcast. Uh, how are you doing this evening? I'm doing very well. Thank you for having me on. Hey, not a problem, not a problem. So, yeah, as you heard, people really, really dug the episode uh, that we did the first time. Uh, introduced quite a few people to, uh, I guess, the, the second realm uh, sort of life and also, uh, I guess, brought more people into uh, uh, Vanu generally. So, um, yeah, great feedback, and uh, I, I certainly appreciate you taking some time to come back on. So, yeah, for, for those who did, maybe didn't catch that, uh, that episode or don't uh, follow you on Twitter, don't follow your work, do you mind uh, starting with an introduction? Who are you and uh, what do you do? I'm known as Smuggler. I'm currently residing in Germany. I've been active in the crypto anarchist scene for, I don't know, 25 years at least. Maybe even more. Yeah, 25 mm -hmm. years sounds about right. Wow. I'm working in uh, security consulting, um, covert communications, uh, operational security, mostly working for people that have secrets to hide, which should be everybody, but apparently only a few are willing to pay for that. Mm -hmm. um, so I do stuff like um, consulting people on how to secure their offices, how to secure their communications, how to have processes that um, defend their secrets. So we, we do stuff like um, consulting for banks, um, consulting for journalists, big companies, um, lawyers. That is like one of the, the works I do. The, the other thing is that I'm involved in a privacy preserving VPN service. And I also operate the Enterplex website and RC server. And I'm involved in several software products um, and a host of things I'm not talking about. Sure. So that is me, basically. 
Very good, very good. And uh, yeah, I would I would definitely recommend. Uh, I said it last time. I'll, I'll say it again for anyone who uh, you know may not have heard it. Definitely go check out. Uh, I first found out about uh, I guess yeah, Smuggler when yeah it was when I when I uh, found uh, the site Interplex.net. Very very good website. Go check it out. And uh, there's also uh, Opaque.link. Which yeah, I'll put I'll put all these in the show notes. But uh, you know Smuggler's work is uh, you know I, I I really do recommend everyone follow it. Um, I read uh, yeah I've, I'm pretty sure I've read everything you put up on Interplex and uh, recently worked my way through your your posts on opaque.link yeah lots of uh, lots of great stuff so I guess um, thank you uh, so yeah I guess first off uh, could you could you tell uh, the listeners a little bit about uh, the article that that, uh, that you wrote the fog of crypto war it was October 2017 uh, what uh, what caused you to, to write it and yeah go, we'll, we'll, we'll begin there I cannot remember the exact reason other than most of my writings go back to me being pissed off about something so I think I, I read some anti-crypto regulation uh, article and I think it was by Bruce Schneier, but I can't remember. And I was thinking, dudes, we have to realize that we're not living in the 90s anymore. And I think that's the main reason I, I wrote the article. It's basically to recap um, the state of the discussion, the possibilities on both sides, and also to, to, to communicate how politics actually works. Because there's, there's this issue that we have a lot of special interest groups that actually think that whatever they want is the the core of wisdom and the height of all knowledge <laughs> and the best thing ever. And what these special interest groups often forget is that politics is a little bit more complicated than just getting what you want. And even defenders of crypto anarchy or cryptography in, in this case are a special interest group. So it was important to basically describe what is actually going on and to open everybody's eyes a little bit on what they're actually dealing with so that communication, discussion, debate would be more effective and that we would be less manipulated into dealing with the wrong issue. Mm -hmm. So that is why I wrote the article. Sure, sure. Yeah, and, and, and I did want to start with that, actually, because that, that's, that's how you begin the article, a section called Politics as Negotiation. And I, I know, I, obviously, uh, like a free market anarchist, crypto anarchist, Venuans, you know, we all know that, that politics is not based on objective fact. It's not based on, you know, it's not based on, you know, pure rationality, you know, um, and logic. Um, it's just not. So, yeah, I think, I think um, uh, the, way, the way you start that and, and that, that kind of explanation, yeah, it's, it's special interest groups, it's... Um, a lot of it's emotion. <laughs> uh, so yeah, for, like for, for free market anarchists, Venuans, or other folks who are, who are uh, more rational, that's, that's why politics is so frustrating. Um, at least that, that's part of it, right? Is that uh, it, it, obviously, uh, like when it comes to economics, it's, there's empirical evidence to show that you know, what they're doing leads to bad results. But that doesn't really matter, right? I mean, that it's, it's, it's a system that they have to uphold. So I, I think that's a, a really good way to start. But I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to you here. Well, I would strongly disagree with you. Oh. So I'm, I'm really sorry, but uh, I don't think that they are any less rational than others. I think the, the real issue that people on the fringes often have is that they completely ignore the complexities of the world. So we, we find something where we are right and then we think that we, that this knowledge is what defines everybody. And I think that's a problem because all societies and all people are not primarily rational. And that even applies to, to free market people, that applies, if you know praxology, that applies to everybody. We often think that, but we're all primarily value-driven. So the, the thing that really decides on how we think what we choose is how our value preferences look like and how our risk adversity looks like, how our fears look like and so on and so on. So in, in a way, 
we might often think that we're more rational, but that has often to do with us not knowing what values other people have and or by, by saying that their values are uh, less valid. And I think that is one of the things one has to realize when it comes to politics and when it comes to bigger organizations and, and societies is that the will and thinking of a lot of other people is just as valid as ours is. And they have good arguments as well. And we have a lot of bad arguments as well. Um, so it's really a negotiation that is taking place. There's no objective thing that you can put out there that says this is the perfect way to live for everybody. I think sure. whatever ideology or politics comes along and claims that is actually the most dangerous that could exist. So I'm a big fan of having some epistemological humility, as we call it, um, and as to, to say, okay, we, we take other people seriously. And the only thing that I really want is I want other people to have the same humility and allow me to experiment to find out what is working better. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not in the business of telling them how they have to live. I, I just deny that they are in the business of telling me. Sure, sure. And I think this is really important because when you start a conversation with, I'm smarter than you, or I know more than you, you almost already have lost the other party. You'll never convince the other party. And even saying what we say is more rational or more, more objective, whatever objective means, that is not the, the basis most people want to work on. It's not that important for them. Um, and it's not how they value success for any rule. So I think it's really important to, to really grasp that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, uh, yeah, that's a, a very good point. Very good point. So I, I guess, to, do you want to speak a little bit to, I guess, the, the, the negotiation happening with Eh, I guess we'll, we'll we'll wait for that. Um, so yeah, we'll we'll jump back in history first, um, and we'll we'll talk about uh, you know what was going on in the 1990s because uh, yeah, I think it's it's good to to, to go back there. So yeah, a lot of folks don't uh, don't know that history. So um, could you tell us a bit about uh, the crypto war that took place in uh, the 1990s? I think uh, some of this involved PGP and Phil Zimmerman, uh, the chipper clip. Uh, could you tell us a bit about uh, those things? Yeah. So there are different ways of how to count in which crypto war we are right now. So there are people that say, okay, there was a first crypto war, which was in the 90s. Then there was another one in uh, the late or the, the 2000s, uh, mid 2000s. And then another one starting around 2016 or something like that. Um, I personally think it's uh, still the same crypto war. So um, I don't actually believe that we won the first crypto war. It, we just had a, a pause, you know, like a, a short term truce for everybody to recover and see what happens. So the first crypto war was mostly about two things, or it was about one fundamental thing. And the one fundamental thing was that uh, public key cryptography became widely available. And it became widely available in two aspects. Um, one was uh, in Netscape, in um, the SSL implementation, so what we see in HTTPS that started back then. That was one of the things. The other thing was uh, pretty good privacy by Zimmerman. And a third thing that happened is that the US government actually tried to preempt some of the crypto developments by um, building a product on their own. Uh, a, com uh, a telephone system based around the Clipper chip, which was an encryption chip for encrypted telephone communication. These are the the three main fields, I think, where most of the crypto war was uh, visible. There are, however, um, I think a lot of small battles that are either forgotten or never never really understood so for example one of the things 
in that um, time frame was the redefinition of the uh, GSM um, protocol, including uh, the introduction of a relatively weak cryptographic algorithm and a network protocol that would allow to uh, switch off that encryption completely. So our issues today with uh, IMSI catchers or stingrays, as they're called in the US, mm -hmm. um, go back to that time as well. And that is a, um, an area where most people didn't notice what was going on. Um, and it's only something that, I don't I think in the US, it, it only became something people knew about in the last 10 years, maybe. So, but that is something coming from the same uh, time period, actually. And the position of the US back then was that strong cryptography, especially strong public key encryption and strong uh, as, um, symmetric ciphers were classified as munitions and were export regulated. It's still a thing it, to a lesser degree now, but um, until a few years ago, you actually, if you wanted to download Java, which was um, distributed by US companies, you actually had to download a patch as well to enable strong encryption. Uh -huh. um, and that allowed Java to be uh, distributed widely, but the strong encryption patch was forbidden from being distributed to Iran, for example. Um, and there's also a relatively widely signed international agreement, it's the Wathenar Agreement, that also regulates the export of cryptographic tools. And that is actually m much older than um, the crypto wars. So there was always an interest in making sure that cryptography, strong cryptography, wouldn't spread to potential enemies. And then in the 1990s, what happens is that cryptography moves from the military and intelligence and banking sector to the uh, private um, computer, the personal computer. And we have developments like PGP, which is arguably the first tool that might a uh, usable um, hybrid cryptography, so uh, public key cryptography plus symmetric cryptography available to the masses. Um, it was usable for people who wanted to actually use it. And it was never really easy to use, but it, it was easy enough to use for, for people who could read documentation. And Zimmerman um, actually wrote it to, at least in part, as a political statement and actually trying to to point out that the export regulations on cryptography are problematic. Um, so there's a whole history about, for example, printing out um, the source code of, of pretty good privacy uh, into books um, to argue that it's a book export and free speech protected and not actually computer code and not actually software that is um, exported there. So that is one of the battles. And there have been court battles over it. There have been a lot of arguments over it. And it is a front where the US government and a lot of other governments lost. There's one thing one has to mention there, and that is not all governments shared the position of the US government. So also in the 90s, the example is, is Germany. Germany actually had a whole different approach to cryptography. So they actually said that um, cryptography should be widely available and that Germany wouldn't have uh, big restrictions on import or export with the exception of some products to some countries. So it was mostly for the like military use of cryptography where, where Germany um, had any restrictions, but it was never forbidden in, in Germany to, to have PGP or use PGP or distribute PGP, uh, even cross borders. Um, then you had the whole um, development around uh, Netscape. So the Netscape browser is one of the first and arguably the first widely used 
web browser and it included something called secure socket layers which allowed encryption of communication it's as i said where https comes from and um, netscape of course wanted to export the browser widely you know it's called World Wide web you know it's not right. called american <laughs> web so and because of regulation the cryptography in netscape was actually um reduced dramatically um if i remember correctly the the key sizes the symmetric key sizes of um netscape ssl were actually reduced to 40 bits just to to clarify what that means 40 bits is something that uh, a provider like uh, Amazon or a website like Amazon could not use today um, because it's uh, far less bits than they actually have connections that they deal with. So they would reuse keys all the time. So just to, to, to you know, bring a little bit scale into this, today 40-bit encryption would be not just hackable, it, it, it would be by accident, uh, thousands of people around the world would get the same key, you know, just because there is so much traffic on the internet. Mm -hmm. And then you also had um, the whole clipper chip debacle. So um, clipper chip was a hardware chip plus a protocol around it that was mostly used for fax encryption and telephone encryption. And it was managed to provide strong cryptography, but with key escrow. So it included a, a protocol that would allow the government to get the keys of a communication in case they needed it. And there are a couple of, of, of um, aspects to the story, but the, the most important two aspects are that number one, the symmetric encryption was actually um, relatively weak in itself. And the other was that the key escrow protocol was actually broken by people from the cypherpunk movement. And it basically showed that the whole clipper ship campaign, which was very strong under Clinton, um, was actually uh, a waste of time and dangerous. Um, because it, it, the clipper chip would allow you to do actually two things. And that is number one, pretend that you're doing key escrow while not doing it. Mm -hmm. um, so if you knew what you were doing, you wouldn't have key escrow and nobody would notice it. And the other thing was you could actually force key escrow without being the government and thus um, tap into the communication of other people. And the that, those are basically the the lighthouses uh, of the beginning crypto war. A lot of people say that we won the crypto wars because today nobody is using the clipper chip. TLS, which is the follow-up protocol from SSL, um, actually uses more or less strong cryptography. And um, everybody can download uh, PGP to its own peril. So for a lot of people, the, the crypto wars were over in the end of 90s. Um, because we won, you know, we had cryptography. And what's happening then is that after 9-11, there's a new kind of crypto war that came up, um, which was mostly about telling people that they shouldn't work in the field. And then you have the new um, crypto war that basically started around the San Bernardino um, shooters. Mm -hmm. So th that's like the historic perspective. There should be one more thing added though, and that there is not just the, the public crypto war or the overt crypto war, but there's also a covert crypto war, um, which has been going on for like after Second World War. Um, it's, it began. And that is about intelligence agencies um, trying to manipulate cryptographic standards. And it is about infiltrating companies that sell cryptographic tools and creating backdoors or weaken the cryptography in those. So there are quite a, a number of, of interesting stories in that field. Um, I think uh, to, to give two extremes there, one is um, the development around the crypto eggy, which was, uh, or still is actually, 
a company in Switzerland that um, sold cryptographic tools, like hardware tools that would do cryptography for you. Mm -hmm. And it was actually operated by, I think, a cooperation of the German and the uh, Americans. And they actually produced cryptographic tools that were breakable by those intelligence agencies. And another example is the DES standard, the data encryption standard, which is the predecessor of IES, which is the current advanced encryption standard and one of the suggested uh, symmetric encryption algorithms um, suggested by the defensive side of the NSA as part of the SUB algorithms that are to be used for um, communication that is not secret. And uh, like um, in the classification of confidential secret, top secret. So, and um, it's basically one of the argument, uh, algorithms that the NSA says the US government has to use um, because the NSA is also defensive. It's not just an uh, offensive um, agency. It also has the task of protecting the communication of the US government. And what happened in DES um, is that the NSA actually influenced um, some technical aspects of DES. And a lot of people were saying, okay, this is, you know, it's an attack, it makes DES weaker, etc. But what the NSA actually did is it hardened DES, it made DES better. Mm. Um, so it could actually be used uh, by the government. And um, they did so uh, based on knowledge on crypto analytic uh, methodology that they had, but nobody else had at that point. Mm. So it's sometimes it's a little bit hard to, to really find out what is going on there. Um, however, there has also been the undermining of, of cryptography by the NSA. So um, I think the, the best example for that is I think it's called double ECCRC, which is um, a random number generator. Um, and within the Snowden um, story, it became known that the NSA actually weakened this um, algorithm and paid a lot of bigger companies like uh, network hardware producers to include this algorithm mm. in their, in their uh, products. Of course. <laughs> so it's 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 you, you you know it's intelligence agencies you never know what they're doing sometimes they're benevolent uh, often they're not um so but that is like the big picture of the early crypto wars sure so i'll, I'll tell you like back, back in 2016 when i i, I guess when, when that news is coming out uh, you know the the government can't hack the spy phone um i know like and they're like well you know they have to weaken the encryption and my you know i just kind of assumed like come on of course they can hack an iphone um so so i guess um could, could you could you kind of speak to a, a little bit uh you know like the uh, speak to the encryption that comes on like consumer devices like that can can the nsa and other agencies and obviously i know you, there's there's no way for you to know 100 percent, but um is it possible that they really couldn't hack a spy phone so there's a it's a little bit of technical detail that you have to keep in mind here so the actual encryption like the on-device encryption file encryption of uh, the iphone has been very secure and is not degraded at least not to my knowledge the the attack there was actually not about the encryption directly itself but it was about attacking the key derivation function so the key derivation function just to explain that mm -hmm. is Cryptographic algorithms usually work on key sizes that are relatively long, let's say 16 bytes, um, 128 bits, or 256 bits. And these keys should be high entropy. Uh, they should be random. The problem is that nobody sits down and types in a 256-bit random key into his iPhone. Mm -hmm. So what you do instead is that you have a security chip in the in the iPhone that um, out of the pin that you enter plus something secret that is in the um, security chip creates a new key 
um, that's the key derivation function. And it's a combination actually of uh, deriving the key from your pin and uh, access control that is done by the pin on that security chip. And out of that security chip comes the actual key for encrypting your device. And what the FBI really wanted is to find a way to trick the, the, the security chip into unlocking the phone, creating that um, key output so they could decrypt the phone. So mm. it was not actually about hacking the encryption of the phone, it was about hacking this chip. And the issue with that chip was that if you configured it correctly and you put in your pin like 10 times the wrong way, then this chip would actually erase its secret data. Mm. So the, the whole debate was actually about those additional technical um, countermeasures because guessing a pin is actually not a problem, you know? Right, that, that's, what, that's what I was going to say. They, they could have cracked that in, in 10 seconds flat, if, you know, a four number pin. Like that, that, would, that, would, exactly. yeah, that would be nothing. That's why I was, con it's like, they really can't hack that? Come on, really, that's, that's, that's exactly. stupid. But yeah, go ahead. Exactly, so it, it, it was really about being able to try out those pins without the security chip destroying itself. Uh -huh. So that was the, the thing that it was about. And in, in a way, the, the debate is actually not so much about crypto when it comes to that case. It is about the additional hardware protections that um, Apple built into the iPhone that made it so hard to guess the pin. However, um, the debate was a little bit of a red herring because at that time, um, commercial tools existed already for hacking those iPhones, like this generation of the iPhone. Mm -hmm. And um, there were multiple uh, known attack vectors against the tool. Um, so there were things like um, you could copy the, the, the chip or reset the pin counter and stuff like that. So there were several of those attacks now. And um, the FBI actually withdrew the, the court case against Apple um, because it was then widely known that those attacks existed and that the phone could be unlocked without the cooperation of Apple. Right. Okay. Okay. That, that makes, uh, yeah, that makes uh, a lot more sense. Well, not not saying the technical stuff necessarily does, but uh, but the reasoning for them not being able to crack the encryption that that makes more sense now. And I'm sure you know it's been it's been three years. I'm sure that's something that's been sitting in the back of people's minds for for a long time. So I'm glad we finally got that clarified. Yes. Um, so let's let's talk about uh, um, so uh, so now that we have some more context with what's with what's going on today, and and, and also as I mentioned in the introduction, kind of uh, the discussion on uh, I guess going after companies that offer encryption software or communication, I guess encrypted communication software. Um, let's talk a little bit about, uh, I guess, the pushback um, that's happening today and why a lot of these uh, a lot of these arguments are bad and, I guess, in, in some cases, even counterproductive. So um, you touch on a, a few common ones. Um, so the, the first one, it's impossible to regulate cryptography or banning cryptography is like banning math. Um, why, why, is, why is that a bad argument? Because it is essentially a meaningless argument. So just because somebody knows how cryptography works doesn't mean that everybody can use cryptography. Um, most people on this planet cannot write computer code and even less people can write any cryptographic code. And out of those people, even less can write secure cryptographic code. Um, so the, the knowledge itself is, relative, is relatively um, meaningless. It's the implementation and the spread in the market that actually counts. And so far, nobody ever has tried to ban cryptographic knowledge. Well, they have tried before the 90s, but after the 90s, nobody did that anymore. Mm -hmm. Because um, everybody knows that cryptography and research in cryptography is actually crucially important. Um, everybody knows that we need cryptography and that we need better uh, cryptography. Everybody knows that. And I think that this argument is one of the, um, the arguments that, that actually um, exists because people don't listen to, to what politicians and police are asking for. 
um, none of them is actually asking for banning cryptography. It's not any any request they have. So it's a um, it's a stupid um, um, counter argument because um, you're engaging with with something that's not there. You know, of course everybody wants cryptography. What their issue is is when cryptography is too good and too widely used by too many people. That is where the issue comes from. It's not about the knowledge. The argument is not about, or the fight is not about the knowledge at all. Right. So, so I, I guess, uh, and you use, uh, I guess, speed limits in your example, but uh, I guess to, to put it another way, would, would you compare this, uh, or I guess, yeah, by, by analogy, would this be something like uh, saying, um, you know, if they try to ban drunk driving, then they'll, then they'll effectively end all road, communi or road transportation. Would that be kind of a, a, similar, um, a similar argument here to show kind of the irrationality or the, I guess, the, the non-applicability? Yeah, it, it, it basically goes into, into the same realm. It's, I call these these arguments um, Asperger arguments because <laughs> um, they are about a very constrained view on how reality works. So, for example, most of the knowledge to build a, a nuclear weapon is actually out in the open. You can go to the library and, and check it out, you know, and people ask, so why is it in the library? The reason is because actually implementing that and doing that is so much harder than just knowing the theory. Nuclear physics is widely known. I mean, most of the stuff you learn in school, you know, doesn't make you able to build a nuclear bomb. Sure. Um, so in, in a way, the argument of saying, oh, they want to ban math is an argument that is actually, it's almost a category error. It's, it's talking about a category of, of objects, of things you want to ban. Um, that is not the same category of what your opponent is talking about. So it's, it's um, I don't know, it's like um, going on the street and, and telling people uh, don't drive too fast, you know, while uh, all they do is smoke hemp, you know, and not <laughs> even have a car. So it's, it's, it's nonsense. It's just nonsense. Sure. Uh, There's sure. No, no good. I, I'm bad in coming up with nonsense. I'm sorry. <laughs> Under, understood. Understood. So um, this the second the second bad argument, um, and this is the one that uh, that I made uh, for uh, I guess yeah maybe I made more than one of these at multiple at, at different times. But anyway, I know for a fact I, I've used I've used this one before. Um, so without cryptography, modern e-commerce is impossible, and the internet would break. Now, I, I, if 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 they were really trying to ban cryptography, generally speaking, this would be a problem. But that's not what they're trying to do, huh? Right. So number one, I, sh I should uh, tell you that all of the bad arguments are arguments that I made at some point in my life as well. So cool. you're in okay. really good I, company. I feel good. I feel better. Um, <laughs> I think everybody in the field they made one of those bad arguments at least once, and you know, fought uphill and said this is the the, the way to go. Um, so the the argument against um, the e-commerce, basically saying, okay, we cannot have e-commerce e without uh, cryptography. It again misses the point because um, nobody is actually saying we want to ban cryptography in every single case. That is what nobody is asking for. We haven't been asking, or the, the state hasn't been asking for that since the 90s. That was the debate back then. You know, the debate back then was before e-commerce, basically. Um, was let's ban cryptography because it, it, before it gets too widely spread. Then e-commerce came and after that nobody is really thinking about taking all cryptography away because we rely on digital communication, we rely on e-commerce. Um, the state um, relies on that as well. <clears throat> and at best there are arguments about weakening um, cryptography in general enough so that e-commerce could work but not enough for the police to be locked out but even that argument is not made today anymore there was the argument about the short key length in the 90s but today we know that cyber criminals are actually pretty capable uh, when it comes to hacking keys the cracking keys and we also have this issue 
that there are enough states that are not friendly to each other that would attack that as well. However, you could actually have e-commerce without um, confidential encryption because the whole debate is actually not about all cryptography. It's actually about confidentiality. So it's about cryptography that hides um, data from the understanding of a third party. Um, but you could have a lot of e-commerce without ever having any confidentiality. Um, it's actually enough to authenticate and integrity protect um, communication and then you could actually have commerce. It would just mean that you couldn't use any credit cards anymore. Mm -hmm. But um, it, it would be possible. But nobody's asking for limiting cryptography in the e-commerce field. So I haven't actually seen any argument for um, taking down uh, SSL or TLS so far. Right. <clears throat> right. Yep. Um, so this this third uh, this third bad argument is uh, any form of regulation makes cryptography insecure. And I guess I'm sympathetic to this uh, to to, the, to this one more more so than the others, just because I mean. <clears throat> It's <laughs> everything the state does; it makes it worse, right? So, I mean, if they if they if they if they regulate cryptography, you know, anytime they regulate anything else, that uh, tends to go to, to go badly, I guess, uh, from 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 my preference. Um, so, well, why is this a bad argument? Well, the bad argument is because it um, takes an absolute position. So, um, it basically introduces the idea that there's only secure and insecure, and that as soon as it touch encryption everything is insecure. Now, the thing is that in reality, the security is often a gradient. So you have more or less security. And then at the extremes, you have completely insecure. And on the other extreme, you have uh, something we don't have, and that is total security. All of our systems today are actually pretty insecure. You know, if you, if you look at the totality of systems, they are already insecure. Cryptography might be often the most secure part of those systems, um, but the rest of the system might be fundamentally broken. I mean, just look at stuff like, um, I think it was yesterday, um, where Facebook lost a few million telephone numbers. Those telephone numbers weren't lost because cryptography was hacked. Facebook is actually using SSL on, the, on all their websites. The, the data was uh, leaked because the, the rest of their system was insecurely managed. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't the fault of cryptography. So the, the problem with the argument is simply this absolute standpoint combined with ignoring the other insecurities. And it is a bad argument because it excludes any negotiation about how much uh, computer security we want compared to other securities that we might also want. And I think that taking an absolute position in that field has to be done honestly and not by making oversimplifications. Sure, sure. Okay. Yeah, that 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 makes sense. Uh, that that definitely makes sense. So I guess uh, just a, a question to close out this section. I mean, uh, if, if if in the and and it's it's kind of it's kind of obvious, but I'll, but I'll ask it just just for for the just just for the heck of it. Um, why why should people stop making these arguments? I mean, um, uh, is, is it if if they want to have a, a seat at the table of uh, public discourse? Uh, is it uh, I mean just just uh, for the sake of maybe not uh, I don't know having um, I don't know why, why should people uh, stop making these arguments? I think the, the most problematic aspects about bad arguments in politics is that you get marginalized and that you lose the sight of, on the real problems that exist. So it's, I think that politicians actually like those bad arguments because as long as we're talking about those bad arguments, we ignore a lot of other issues and we're distracted. So it's, it's a little bit of um, a straw man, you know, that is put out there, you know, um, to, to engage with while the real action happens somewhere else. So it is dispersing the energy of those that are against crypto regulation and 
it also blinds us from the big picture and that means that um, when push comes to shove, we are actually not talking about the same thing mm -hmm. and hence not actually participants in the debate. Sure, sure. Okay. Um, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. So motives for regulating cryptography. Now, this one's pretty obvious, right? At least uh, uh, for, for you know, folks who've been paying attention, uh, you know, recently. Always comes down to, uh, to law enforcement, or as we call them on this podcast, uh, bludgies. It's always because the bludgies can't do their jobs, it seems. So um, at least uh, at least today. So t I guess t tell us a bit about, uh, you know, why, why, why are they making a big stink? You know, what's, uh, what, what's going on in, uh, I guess, uh, today's crypto war or just, uh, I guess, uh, the, the current state of the crypto war, if it's uh, been the... the the same one the entire time so the police is tasked with a job um, at least by most people of the mainstream society and they say okay we want the police to protect us and we want to make sure that the police catches evil people so they can be punished both of these um, missions are uh, missions that are widely supported. Um, most people actually want police to protect them because they don't want to protect themselves or cannot protect themselves. And most people actually have this tendency that they actually want criminals to be punished, especially really bad criminals, you know, like murderers and uh, child rapists and whatever, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's people that we don't like and we want them to pay for their crimes. So. Um, the police is one of those institutions tasked with these two missions and the police is to a certain degree trying to fulfill this mission. They might not always be the smartest when it comes to that and they are not always the most efficient. But in general, most policemen and most people arguing for the police are at least trying to go in that direction and cryptography makes it hard for them um, at least when it comes to certain crimes um, there's this issue that because everything today is digitalized and everybody has a smartphone that even criminals have smartphones and um, while in the olden days criminals would you know meet in the forest or in the bar to conspire um, today they use um, WhatsApp or whatever else. I'm not so sure what criminals use these days. <laughs> um, and I'm <laughs> sorry. Um, so of course the police would like to get additional evidence. That is one thing. But what is actually higher on their agenda, at least when it comes to um, communication, is to find out about other um, conspirators. Mm. Um, especially in more complex crimes like um, terrorism. Um, the people actually committing the act are um, the last element of a network of, of people working together to um, commit those acts. You know, most of them are not single shot uh, terrorists. They are people that run a terrorist enterprise and they want to repeat attacks. They want to create new attacks. Um, and the dude usually ending up dead or ending up in jail is actually the least terroristic of them. Um, but it's the guy who, you know, blows up the bomb or shoots people. So the police actually wants to dismantle those networks because those networks enable future stupid people blowing other people up. So it's relatively understandable why they want access to that information. They are thinking about, hey, maybe they dropped um, the name of another conspirator or they dropped the address of a safe house or a stash. Um, so police is really interested in, number one, making the case better in the case that the terrorist is still alive. In most cases, that's not the case, right? And, um, or the case is so obvious, you know, that um, just to put the guy uh, into jail forever, you don't mm -hmm. need additional evidence. But you might want to find out the bigger network, you want to prevent uh, f future attacks, and you want to get everybody who conspired in the crime. So that is what makes them interested, at least publicly. Um, 
about that, that communication. Of course, there are a number of other crimes they want that communication as well for. Um, it starts with terrorism on, on the high end and then goes through stuff like uh, fraud and child pornography, whatever, down to um, hate speech. So, but the mission is more or less always the same. It is, um, they want evidence for court cases and they want to dismantle uh, organizations. That is what the access to communication is all about. Sure, sure, and and I think you just uh, you just highlighted it, but uh, uh, we're we're, we're kind of getting to, to the point here where we're we're finding out the difference between 1990 and today, and um, it, it I guess the the way that I see it, or I guess the, the way that I understand it, is the state isn't trying to snatch strong cryptography from the hands of people; they just want access to the plain text of the communications. Um, is that uh, kind yes. of the gist of it? Yes. So I think one of the things that a lot of people in, in politics and security have understood is that they are unable to make specific demands on technology because they don't they know that they don't understand technology and they know that the development of technology is extremely widely spread so they would have at no point the ability to actually make uh, valid suggestions or to enforce them and they're very well aware of that the that means that instead of asking for specific steps they basically are asking for a guarantee of the end result so they're asking for plain text not for a specific a specific way to go uh, to get to the plain text of course they make some suggestions um so there is of course the issue that a lot of people say it's impossible to do um, and then you have people, and often very smart people, uh, from, for example, the GHCQ, uh, the uh, British um, NSA, making suggestions on how such a system could work in theory for a specific uh, use case. Um, but in general, it is not about defining how to get to the goal, but just to describe the state of the system. Right, right. <clears throat> so I, I guess let's let's go ahead and, and get into um, now. There is a, there is um, I, I guess a section we're skipping here. Um, basically, the the different ki kinds of data and how that how I guess uh, it, how government g uh, gains access to that data or how they could gain access to it. Um, I figure we'll we'll kind of go past that. I, I do recommend I guess at the beginning uh, read read the entire article. But I, I think uh, um, we'll, we'll focus on on uh, the means to regulate actually what they what they could could potentially do because that is highly relevant to uh, privacy advocates for uh, you know. Of anyone who would like to uh, keep their communications private. So, yeah, let's talk about what they uh, what they could possibly do. And uh, the the first thing you mentioned is outlaw strong algorithms. Yeah, could you talk about that? Is that possible? Paper is very patient, and paper written with laws is very patient. So yes, you could outlaw um, certain algorithms. You could make them illegal to use. There's a, a real load of, of things that are illegal to use. Um, even though nobody really cares about that. So just outlawing that uh, while it is possible, it's not very sensible. Um, number one is the same strong algorithms is something you want to use as a government yourself and you want your own industry also to use. You know, you want your own companies um, to, to use those strongest algorithms to defend themselves against the Chinese. For example so it's not really sensible to do that but it's possible because law is what you write it's not necessarily enforced right right um so another possibility is that they could manipulate strong algorithms so um i guess uh, maybe put in uh manipulate them in such a way as to make them easier to break and so i i think this is this 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 one seems right in their wheelhouse something like that they could do it is something they have actually tried so there is actually this attack on double ECCRC that the NSA tried mm, um, yeah. and it is almost guaranteed a weakening, so, though I'm not completely sure on the math behind it, but um, it seems to be a weakening of the, of the system. So it is something they try, but when they try it, it's something they do underhandedly. They don't want to be caught trying that because 
if everybody knows that an algorithm has been manipulated, nobody is going to use it. Right. So um, it's not a very effective way to do this. Sure. Okay, and uh, number three, this one, uh, this this one uh, just made the news. Uh, I guess in the past, uh, yeah, this year. I don't remember if it was a couple months ago or a few months ago, but it it, it was in the news, uh, undermining. Uh, I guess. Uh, let me see. Is is it that one? Yeah, under, I guess uh, undermining protocols. Uh, could you speak to that one? Yeah. So there are two main aspects there. That is um, undermining protocols and undermining default settings. I would like to go to the default settings first because sure. it's easier to understand. So imagine you have something like a signal, which is a secure messaging app, and it relies on um, each party knowing the um, identity of the other party and to know a, uh, um, a key, a public key that is exchanged with the other party. It's called security numbers, if I remember correctly, um, with signal. And nothing in the signal protocol can prevent somebody, an attacker, from distributing new uh, security numbers, which is why signal tells you when those numbers change and allows you to actually manually verify them. You can read them to each other. When you look at apps, uh, WhatsApp, at least uh, two years ago, they are using basically the same um, algorithms for encryption, the same protocol but they wouldn't notify you if um, these, these security numbers changed. Mm. So an attacker could get in line um, without you as a normal user ever noticing that because you don't really deal with encryption yourself. You never see the keys. Um, all you see is a nice user interface and you can type and you believe it's secure. So. Um, undermining those defaults, you know, how do you present changes to the system? How do you present keys? Do you enforce um, key verification by the parties? Is uh, ways to undermine the security of the system without actually undermining the cryptography uh, the least. You can have enormously strong cryptography, but you can manipulate the user to use it insecurely. And that is what the whole changes of defaults is about. Mm. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Let me. Yeah. Let me. Yeah. Let me. Let me jump <laughs> jump in there for a second. Uh, is this is this is something I've noticed within, I guess, just o open source community in general. And and, and this is. Well, I guess maybe just in the in the field of privacy, a, a lot of people want user friendliness, and obviously, if it, if if there's going to be wide use of any of these things like Signal, it has to be really user friendly. So, I, I guess one of one thing that comes to mind is this could be a means a means for the state to regulate it, but this is also kind of a, a consumer demand in some ways, right? Like people people do want encryption, but they don't they don't want to take the time to learn too much about it. They don't want to um, see a bunch of numbers that they don't understand. I, I guess that this seems like it could just be yeah, it could it could be a vulnerability just from, I guess, consumer demand from that standpoint too. Yes, yes. Though there is uh, currently uh, and luckily um, a huge movement to create protocols that are self-verifying. So, for example, um, we all hate Google, but um, Google is actually um, running a really important project. And it's called Certificate Log, and Certificate Log is um, a verifiable data structure, which means basically that they are collecting um, information about SSL certificates that protect websites and put them into a data structure that allows for automatic verification that no other additional certificates exist for that website. So it's a way to to globally pin the connection between the website and the SSL certificate mm -hmm. or TLS certificate. Um, and this is something that they actually um, built into the Chrome browser. So the Chrome browser, um, I think, uh, for the last half year, maybe, actually has this ability. And I'm not sure if it's um, enabled by default, but they want to enable it by default for sure is that Chrome, the Chromium would find out if there's a man in the middle attack by using that um, data structure, which is not manipulatable by Google or anybody else. 
so that is one of the things or um, a few years ago I was in, involved in a messenger project that um, sadly failed uh, completely but we released some of our stuff and one of the things was actually a key server that um, just with the knowledge of the name of the other party you could actually have a secure key exchange that couldn't be manipulated by us or anybody else. So there are movements towards creating additional protocols that make communication systems uh, self-verifiable so that the user actually doesn't have to care about the key. Right. However, all of those tools are still very much in development. There are nothing in that realm is widely spread when it comes to messengers. There's no messenger I know of that is self-verifying so far. Right, yeah, and, and I'm not saying that user friendliness is a bad thing. I just know from from talking to as, as part of this crypto anarchism series, talking to so many developers and programmers, is is that whenever um, and, and also with with project I'm working on, Darklands, um, with 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 every with every technological project like that, there are trade offs. And if if user friendliness yes. is prioritized, then um, you know, as with like it, like what WhatsApp's doing, you know, maybe you know, just it, you know, could could be malicious, obviously, probably malicious, but it may have just been completely innocent. Like maybe they didn't, maybe. That maybe they maybe the users didn't want to deal with it, right? So, exactly. I mean, I, I I can I can understand I can understand it. I just I just there there's that 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 issue that that we're we're talking about that it, it could be a vulnerability. So okay, yes. yeah, okay, very good. Okay, so the the other question you had was um, undermining protocols, mm -hmm. and that is one of the things that is actually uh, one of the proposals of the Five Eyes is when it comes to messengers. Um, they propose that Signal and WhatsApp, etc., make a slight little change to their protocols and user interfaces that would introduce a third party into a conversation, basically turning the conversation into a group chat and just conceding that this third party has been added on demand. So essentially you would still have complete end-to-end -end encryption on all that except that one more person is listening or participating and um, that has been the main proposal uh, by the GHCQ it comes from GHCQ and has been widely supported within the 5 i countries mm -hmm. <sighs> yeah <clears throat> that's yeah that's uh that's not good. So, so I guess a question I have, and and, and obviously from talking to Jamie Baconic uh, about, uh, I guess the the management engines that are in basically every computer since 2008 or something, that you, you, your, the software you run is only as secure as the operating system. Um, so, so I guess like with with Signal, with other encrypt like Signal and Wire, for example, you know the the encryption might be strong, but the operating system itself is. I understand there's there's problems with that. That you know there there could be screen captures yes. before the encryption actually happens. All those things, but 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 those aside, obviously a lot of people use the encryption apps that are available on app stores, right, on the phones that they use. Yes. So do you, do you foresee a future where like uh, obviously there's there's uh, you know quite a walled off garden there. I mean, it's really hard to get apps into into the the Apple App Store. Do you foresee a future where no apps on the App Store will be secure? That um, the the state will basically just force Apple and Google Play Store to remove or or to only have encryption software on there or communication software on there that does have vulnerabilities introduced? Do you think that's possible? I think it is one of the more realistic scenarios where everything is going to. Though I would like to qualify that a little bit. I don't think that the future will be about every app is insecure for everybody. I think that the, the security forces are very well aware that they do not want to lower security too widely. They want to do it with people that they're after, but they don't want to do it with everybody else because that introduces a whole host of complications. So <clears throat> what is most likely going to happen, in my opinion, is that um, there will be a lot of secure apps on the App Store, but it might be that um, either the operating system itself or the App Store contains targeting capabilities. Ah. So basically, you could say that a specific person gets a weakened version of an app. Um, 
so the app provider to be legal would have to have such a version in store, but it wouldn't be delivered to everybody. It would only be delivered to some people, people where they have a warrant or whatever. And then there would be a more or less silent update that gives you that slightly modified version of the tool. And mm -hmm. basically that that is one of the most likely scenarios because from a security standpoint, the app store already has more or less full control over the apps that are installed. Oh yeah. And so it, it doesn't introduce an actual new security vulnerability here. And even today, app stores are targeted. Um, you know that, you know, you buy an app and then you can download it. That is just another form of targeting. Um, it's targeting people that paid for that app, right? Mm -hmm. So, and because all of our devices today, Android, whatever, are personalized, they actually are relatively easy to target. So that is one of the, the methods that would work widely, not make it f much more insecure for most people. And that would be relatively hard to detect. Sure. So I, I guess um, a question that comes to mind with that, so obviously, ideally, people wouldn't have smartphones if they care about privacy, because that's just that's just kind of a given. Everyone kind of knows that, right? But <laughs> it's true for everything else. It is even true for your Linux computer. Yeah. The, so, the same methods can work on your Linux computer. It's not really just about the app store. Gotcha. Oh, okay. Okay. So, so, so I guess the, 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 the question still stands then. I mean, what, what, um, I guess what, what suggestions, uh, would you have it? Like if someone, uh, is, is you some, if someone has, uh, you know, an Android phone, should they avoid app stores and just download APK files from directly from websites? I mean, what, what are some ways to mitigate like the, these are some malicious things and, 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 and I mean, obviously, you know, governments use these. So, I mean, what, what are some possible ways to mitigate the mitigate this without just abstaining from using technology in general? It is actually extremely hard to mitigate and there is no general tool out there right now that prevents us from those attacks or protects us from those attacks. Um, the, there, there are a lot of, um, how you say that? There's a lot of unrealistic device, uh, advice. So for example, you have people that say, just download the source, compile it yourself, you know, then you can be sure that it's fine. The problem is that nobody knows the source. I mean, if you download the source of, of Signal, I'm pretty sure you will not be able to verify it um, and uh, do that with every update, you know? So right. it's it's completely unrealistic that people do that. The What you really need is an infrastructure, a wide infrastructure that at least detects if this, an individual is targeted. So. There are proposals in that field. So, for example, there are directories of um, compiled source that, and the compilation uh, process is deterministic. So it means that if you have the source and you compile it, it will always cre create exactly the same output on every machine, which is actually not that trivial. It's, um, it's something that, that took a long while to be mastered. Mm -hmm. And with that, you can do stuff like have a lot of people download the source individually, compile it, and then publish the hash of the output. And then you can verify, okay, there are another 100,000 people out there that get exactly that same output. And there is an interesting thing, and sadly, I have to say it's about Google again. Um, Google recently, like two days ago, released an update to their uh, Go programming language, um, which includes a package manager for downloading source and compiling it. Mm -hmm. And they actually integrated this certificate lock uh, algorithm into the package manager and source management of Go. So today you can start with a very small file that you have to securely um, procure. And from there, you can download all the dependencies and make a, a compilation that is actually cryptographically secured against individual targeting. So it's really hard to slip um, code backdoors um, in, into source code and target them on, on just one user. So you 
what this does is that if an attacker cannot target an individual user anymore, it has uh, he has to target a lot of users. And targeting a lot of users increases the probability of uh, the backdoor being discovered. So the common criminal might not be able to verify um, his software, but if the same software is distributed to everybody, which includes security experts, then those security experts might actually find out that a backdoor is included. So um, what, what is happening, but it's not widely spread yet, but what is happening is that people are becoming aware that they have to prevent targeting um, when it comes to updates and when it comes to, to source code distribution. There's another project that I've been involved in that is uh, CodeChain, um, which is something that uh, Frank Braun is mostly working on, but we designed it together. And it was actually designed as a response to the fog of crypto war. And it is actually a combined code review and um, target prevention um, system for distributing source code and binaries by now, actually. So it actually allows you to have um, a review process in creating the code so that an individual programmer cannot be coerced into introducing a backdoor and all the way up to the point where the resource code is actually distributed to users and automatically compiled. So there are a couple of, of projects that are actually dealing with not being targeted. So far, however, um, that hasn't reached um, any mass computing environment. So there's uh, no such prevention in Android yet, though I actually think they might, they might create it. And there's no such prevention in, in iOS so far. Um, there's also uh, no such prevention in, in Mac OS or Windows. There are a few experiments in doing that on a few Linux distributions. It's not mass usable and secure yet, but we might get there in the next, I don't know, three, four, five years. And then we will have at least no targeting which is a huge step. If you can prevent targeting, um, you make it extremely hard to have um, backdoors. Right, right. So, I mean, and, and obviously I, I, I hate the mentality and obviously I, I, I hate the mentality and I, and, and I don't think it's, it's useful that, you know, I, there, there's, <laughs> there aren't a lot of uh, solutions to, to these things yet, um, but that doesn't mean that individuals shouldn't try to practice as good operation security as possible, that they shouldn't exercise as much sure. privacy or utilize as many of these tools, even if only, and this, this is what I've said for, for years, even if, even if it's only to make it a pain in the ass for the state, make, you know, just even if it's an extra, step, extra step for them, or if everyone's using PGP emails, um, then they have to decrypt every single one of them to, or I guess they don't have to, but um, then they'll have to wade through a lot more, they, they'll have to wade through a lot more encryption rather than plain text. So it's, right. it's, yeah, it, it makes sense. The, the, the stuff is hard, right? Um, it's hard. So I, 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 I mean, I, I always kind of re recommend to folks, uh, you know, Jamie Baconic has, uh, has ghost pads, the, the, the management engine's removed, and you can make them as private and secure as, uh, as you want, and I guess within, within capability, obviously. Um, and, you know, use it, you know, build a dark, you know, build a dark Android, find a way uh, to, to, to do that uh, as privately as privately as possible. But it, it kind of seems like if, if there's something that has to remain private, then you, you, you're better off leaving electronics behind and, you know, going to somewhere else, going, going, going somewhere else in isolation. <laughs> that kind of seems where it's at. <laughs> well, uh, I, I would like to, to interject a little bit mm -hmm. in your advice there. Sure. And that is, we have two issues that are linked, but not the same. And that is the whole issue of, of tracking by Android, by, by iOS, whatever, and by a lot of apps, of course. And you have the issue of system security. Today, it is really hard to decide what is more harmful. Is it an insecure system or a less secure system? Or is it um, not having any tracking? And Yes, you can set up uh, Android mostly without uh, any Google callbacks or anything. So there's stuff like the Micro G uh, framework that 
is actually working on um, replacing all the libraries in Android that talk to Google with uh, open source um, alternatives that are Google free, that don't spy on you. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, you can build an Android uh, and it's all micro G and you are less trackable. The problem, however, is that um, devices like Android or operating systems like Android or iOS are extremely widely used. You know, there are literally billions of people on the planet that use one of those two, mm -hmm. which makes them uh, juicy targets and makes them um, looked at closely by security researchers, which means that they find security holes all the time which means that there are updates all the time. And the real question is, if you build your own system, will you be able to actually stay on top of the updates? Mm. And if you aren't, if you aren't able to do that, then all your anti-tracking and whatever doesn't help you at all because they're just gonna hack your iPhone, you know? Yeah. So um, there is this trade-off, you know, there's this, anti-tracking versus. Um, and I think that so far we don't have a really awesome solution for that. I mean, so for example, the company I work for, they have a product, uh, which is a VPN product, which also includes anti-tracking uh, capabilities. It basically blocks um, a lot of trackers that are built into apps and built into the mobile operating system. So it prevents those trackers to actually communicate with the phone or vice versa. But it's an add-on and our reasoning, for example, for developing the add-on is um, because we said it's impossible for us to actually provide a patched version of Android that is um, secure and maintain that. Um, so it's much easier to say, okay, use the standard Android default and we gonna help with suppressing as much of the tracking as we can. But it's an uphill battle on both sides. And I often have doubts when people that are not completely immersed in technology and know exactly what they do to use those hacks. I'm, I'm critical about that because it's so easy to miss an update. It's so easy to do something wrong. And then when it comes to your security, you're much worse off than using the off the shelf stuff. So I am more on the side of saying there is no good solution and you should just be aware of what is happening. You should be aware that you're tracked, you know, because mm -hmm. right now you cannot completely prevent it while using chance system, you know, um, be aware that it happens, um, be relatively smart about the additional tool to use to suppress attackers, for example. I mean, if you're technically inclined, you can use something like Pi-hole, for example, to reduce a lot of tracking, uh, at least in your home network. Um, and better use that and use off-the-shelf um, OS updates and actually off-the-shelf uh, app updates, because a lot of the free app stores have as many and more security issues than the official um, Google store. Right, right. Okay, interesting, interesting. So I, I guess th there was there was one other I guess um, one other possibility for regulation that I wanted to that I wanted to talk about just because it has some interesting I guess legal implications uh, for at least here in the and uh, the USSA where you know uh, there was a constitution with a bill of rights that apparently mattered at one point. I never lived I never lived when it mattered, but uh, apparently they did at some point. Um, but uh, anyway, mandatory key discovery. Um, what's what what is that? What does uh, this entail? <sighs> And so, um, key discovery schemes, um, there, there's a technical and there's a legal aspect of that. So let's do the technical because it's easier. It basically means that your device keeps logs of all the keys it's using. And, um, when I get a hold of your device and I'm the police, I can access those record. So that is the easy form. I don't think that it's realistic to be used because it has a lot of security implications. However, there is um, a weak link to all systems and that is the human using it. Um, so if the human is still alive and I have the human's iPhone, 
I might force that person to unlock his iPhone um, and give me forensic access to it. Um, same with Android and everything else. So if um, the state creates legal demands on unlocking devices, they don't have to break that much encryption, right? Um, because they just circumvent it through the user. Mm -hmm. um, there are several moves in that direction. So um, when you enter the US, for example, especially if you're not an American, they can basically ask you to unlock your device, and they often do actually. There have been a lot of cases when it comes to face ID or fingerprint ID that uh, devices were forcibly unlocked. It has actually been done with dead people as well. So um, you, you found a, a dead person, then you re uh, revive the fingerprint and unlock the iPhone with that, for example. Mm -hmm. There has been recently a court case that not just uh, divulging um, um, passwords, but also using your face or your fingerprint to unlock your phone is unconstitutional. It, how meaningful that um, ruling is in real life is questionable. Yeah, is a, is a, is a, is so a bloody going to get in trouble if they, were, if, if they force someone to do it? No, they're not going to get in trouble. So, yeah. <laughs> well, they actually will. So there's, and that is only true for the US, but if evidence is collected in an illegal manner, and it's provable that it was, then it's uh, a, a get out of jail card. Okay, um, right, right, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, fair enough, yeah. So, but that is only true, actually, for the US. I mean, I'm actually not aware of any other country where um, this poisonous tree, fruit of the poisonous tree doctrine actually exists. Um, there are a lot of countries where um, there's actually no problem with the police forcing you to unlock your device. Um, a good example is the UK, for example, where the uh, law enforcement actually has this power. Um, they can put you to jail if, if you don't unlock your device. There are discussions in uh, Germany about the same thing. Um, it's not law here yet, but it probably will become this year. There are places like New Zealand and Australia where it's already law. Um, then there are places where law simply doesn't matter at all, um, China, Russia, etc. Mm -hmm. So divulging keys is, 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 a, is a relatively commonly used method. And in a way, the US is actually leading the protections in that field um, internationally. It's one of the few countries where there are actually court cases against that that are won. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah. Right, and, and yeah, the, that was the, the, the comment I was going to make. I, I did, a, I guess, just a, a, a very short search just to see what, what sort of, uh, uh, you know, case precedents existed for, for this. And, and also, in Just Below the Surface, A Guide to Security Culture by Kyle Reardon, he went through. He, uh, the article was titled something like, uh, Are Cellular Telephones Furthering Human Liberty? And he talked about, he examined a bunch of different cases. And in general, um, I guess generally speaking, when it comes to cell phones, yeah, you, you don't really have any, any legal rights. But um, with forcing, uh, with mandatory key discovery like we're talking about here, um, I, I think one of those, like, uh, yeah, again, it was just a tentative search, but it seems like uh, it seems like the the stance, or I guess the, the current precedent, is that forcing someone to disclose their keys is a violation of the Fifth Amendment, um, self incrimination. Right. So that's I, I don't know how long that's going to last, but well, and, and it's with all legal stuff, it's often more complicated than a single statement. Um, so, for example, if um, the data is actually not used to um, show the guilt of a person, um, then it's not self-incrimination. So there have been cases where the police said, we already know what is on, on the device and you're going to jail for that anyways, you know, because we have other proof. But now give us more data so we can go after other people. And there have been cases where people have been held in contempt of court for not uh, revealing their passwords because it was actually not about their own sentencing anymore. Mm -hmm. So there's always um, a complication and there are always methods to, to, um, to circumvent um, if you have the right argument in front of the court. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah. So um, the last, I guess the the last means to regulate here, um, and I, and I guess this would be this this possibly could have uh, could have been revealed in maybe the Vault Seven leaks, but uh, lawful hacking, and, and I guess this 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 could this could also overlap with maybe I guess uh, uh, software uh, software backdoors too, right? So uh, why don't you talk a little bit about lawful hacking and uh, what happens there? Okay, legal hacking is has actually become one of the main uses for cybercrime investigation in the last few years. And it has been mostly led by the Netherlands, which have a law that allows them to um, hack computers unless they know that they're not in the Netherlands. So um, they are allowed to hack everywhere. Um, as long as they don't know that they're uh, violating the sovereignty, like really know that they're violating the sovereignty of another country, mm -hmm. which makes the Dutch police actually one of the go-tos for international cybercrime investigations. So, for example, a lot of the um, recent cases of, of um, darknet market takedowns have actually revolved um, around the Dutch police having that capability and that right. So um, it is a tool that is used right now. Um, outside of the, um, let's say, uh, relatively law-abiding states, um, legal hacking is extremely widely spread. So um, creating uh, or placing Trojan horse um, um, software malware on the computers of criminals, opponents, uh, mistresses, and so on and so on is widely spread. Um, there are quite a few uh, companies uh, in the West that sell this capability to every tyrant uh, that runs around. And there's a huge industry about this. So it's not just about the state, it's, it's actually about uh, free market companies um, providing those tools for money. And it is uh, an enormous threat right now. There is an issue with hacking, mm, at least in the context of the state, and that is the double role of the state again. That the state is not just, uh, and not only has the mission to go after criminals, but also to prevent people um, from being victims of criminals. Which means that um, if you want to legally hack, or hack at all, you have to be uh, aware of a uh, security vulnerability that you can exploit. And that creates a target conflict, a goal conflict, because if the state knows about such a vulnerability, it has both the interest to use this knowledge to go after criminals. Mm. And on the other hand, it has um, the obligation to protect its citizens. So it's like a little dilemma there. There are various strategies on how to lessen this dilemma, which are not that important. There are a few mentioned in the, in the paper. But the, the real issue is that those vulnerabilities are valuable. There's a whole market on uh, finding and trading those uh, knowledge about those vulnerabilities, mm. which means that um, there's also the incentive for software developers to maybe actually place vulnerabilities in their code so mm, that yeah. later they can sell that knowledge to the state uh, or to to anybody else and that is especially an issue with open source um, software because there is no company no reputation often the developers are not um, really known so there's very little risk for a developer to introduce such a, a such a backdoor and or vulnerability that is factually a backdoor because it's intentionally um, and then later on sell it to an exploit trader and there have been several stories of that already happening however i'm not completely sure how much truth is in those stories and mm -hmm. i didn't follow them um, uh, completely so i'm I'm not 100% uh, uh, sure if this has played out already or not. Right, right. 
<clears throat> so, so I guess uh, you, you mentioned something interesting a few moments ago. How um, you know the the, the uh, additional power that the Dutch have that they, they they just can't knowingly spy on anyone on any Dutch citizen. If they don't know for sure, then they can then 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 they can. No, no. Or, they can they can on, they can spy on Dutch citizens. They cannot knowingly uh, spy on non-Dutch people. But if you have a computer on the internet, especially when it's hosted in Tor, then you don't know where it is. And that is enough. It's fair enough. Good. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. So, so I, I guess, um, yeah, okay. Never mind then. That, that's, 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 okay. That makes sense. Um, I, I guess let, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about, imp uh, which we, we've kind of already talked about some, but implications for privacy advocates. I mean, it, it, it's, you know, as, as we've, we've kind of uh, discussed so far, it's, uh, seems like there's not a whole lot of uh, good solutions out there that doesn't seem like it so the, the question comes to mind uh, who, who's winning the crypto war right now I think in the short term the state might actually uh, win it in the long term I have more hope the reason is this I think that and that is one of the reasons I wrote the article is we are often distracted from the real issues and the real issue behind the current crypto war is about your control over All right, smuggler, your first supply change. Hey, smuggler, you're you're you cut out for about five five or ten seconds. I'm not sure. Okay, very good, very good. So I, I know the yeah the last the last question I asked was uh, who's winning the crypto war, and you said short term. Do you think that it's uh, yeah. the, the state long term? Uh, yeah, um, I'll just yeah, just kind of pick pick up wherever wherever you, wherever you want to. I think that um, short term, the state is going to win. However, I think that in the long term, it will be us winning. And the reason for that is this. I think that the, um, the crypto war is really not so much about crypto alone, but about the integrity of our systems. It's about user control over our systems. And it is about secure software supply chains and maybe even secure hardware supply chains. And I think that in the past, we were much less aware of that. There has been a certain naivety about, about the, uh, the, the bigger issue of uh, system control, integrity, and, and security. And I think that in the last few years, that has changed people have become much more aware about the state of security. They have been much more, they, they have become much more dependent on the integrity of their systems. And with the growth of the open source movement, the questions of quality review auditing are becoming questions that become more pressing. So, and I think that a lot of these things will be solved with enough time we will be able to solve uh, a lot of the pressing integrity and control um, questions. There is a lot of work that is done there. It's not just ready yet and it's not widely spread. However, I think that we might be surprised there because if you think about uh, Apple and Google what you want, they actually have some huge interest in creating more secure platforms. They rely on the security of the user's platforms. And there is a lot of work that is done by both companies and others in having more security while preserving some tracking. And it might be so much easier to um, battle the tracking and cooperate on the security uh, side. But it will take it will take a few more years because before um, we are in a state where we can maybe win the crypto war for a little while. However, I don't think that the crypto war will be completely and ever over. There are strong interests on the side of the state and on the side of a huge part of the population to regulate cryptography. And 
I think that it's really important that in every new phase of the crypto war, we are right, we're really becoming aware of what the issue of the day is and to adapt our arguments and to adapt our work um, to counter those new threats on the one hand. On the other hand, I think it's really important to become um, more analytic and predictive when it comes to attacks. I think it's um, it's high time that we start being active and not just reactive in those matters. Right, right. <clears throat> so, Smuggler, I, I know, um, it, I mean, there are pro pro probably quite a few reasons why my listeners uh, like you as a guest so much, um, but, but I know one of them is that you, you, you take a very realistic approach at examining the nature of the, the situation that you know, we as privacy advocates face today. And, and I wanted to, to kind of uh, uh, counter that with, um, I, I've, I've been looking, you know, I, just looking for more information, right? I'm, I'm trying, to, trying to learn as much as I can about, you know, privacy and security on the internet, so operation security, all, all that good stuff. So I, uh, I ordered a book. But I'm I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna say what it is. I don't. I don't want to. I don't want people to buy it, really. But, but <laughs> I mean, there was there. I, I guess what, what I will say is I learned about some new tools that I, that I can try out. That was you know that that, that was good and all. But there, there was there was um, I wasn't familiar with. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not too familiar with Tor and how all that works and and uh, um, and, and, and a lot of those details. But uh, he got to the Bitcoin section, and he recommended multi-bit wallet. And like that's that like that's like that's the the one part of the book I had, had any kind of knowledge on. And I was like, hold on a second. Multibit was the first wallet I used. when I had no idea what was going on. And actually, Multibit locked me out of some of my funds um, because just the wallet broke. So I realized that I should probably take. It, that was probably about halfway through the book. I realized I should probably take most of that with a grain of salt, because yeah, you know, it's it's. Uh, it promises anonymity on the internet. Um, so, so I guess the the point is, um, I, 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 it's one reason that I that I that I like having you on and talking with you is because you you have a realistic approach to this, and you're not just going to sell people on on you know on uh, security theater or privacy theater, so to speak. At least I try not to. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, oh yeah, all we all we can all we can do is try. So um, yeah, I I know I appreciate that, and I know my listeners do uh, do as well. So I guess just a question on that note, it can be your work or or or, or wherever. But um, where where can I go, and where can my listeners go for like uh, I guess um, for more information on what we what we've talked about today? Uh, good book recommendations, articles, websites, things of that nature. What what what's, uh, what suggestions do you have? As you know, I'm. I'm always sad if I have to disappoint you or your listeners, but I have no idea. <laughs> no idea. <laughs> no idea. So it, it, the, the thing with the whole field, like privacy and, and security, is I greatly mistrust simple descriptions, uh, to-dos, uh, single manuals, whatever. And there are two reasons for that, three reasons for that. Number one, there are not actually many people that really understand security and privacy in depth. There are so many amateurs out there, it's unbelievable. And um, in a way, most security and privacy researchers are amateurs in one piece or another without knowing. So. And there's this thing that if you don't actually have knowledge of your own, you might very easily fall into the trap of trusting whatever advice you get without mm -hmm. knowing a good reason why you should trust it. And that is actually true, not, not just for normal people that are not working in the field, it's actually true for people working in the field as well. Um, I mean, I probably gave a lot of really bad security advice in my in my career, and I'm sorry for every single instance, but I didn't know better. And I know that it's true for every other uh, security and privacy researcher out there. We make a lot of mistakes. And in a way, the only way to defend against that is to keep always in the loop and actually gather some theoretical knowledge as well. So there is no, there simply is no, no easy solution right there. And that is even true for, for security products. Um, I mean, I kind of know how to, how to secure most of my systems myself to a certain degree, but 
I wouldn't necessarily trust that a supplier, especially when it comes to hardware, is actually able to do that for me because there are um, complications in that like the supply chain, there are complications like shipping, there are complications like limited knowledge. So um, I'm always a little bit uh, skeptical when it comes to easy solutions. However, many easy solutions are better than no solutions. If you, if you have some knowledge um, how systems work and you're just lacking the, the last 50% of doing it yourself, then you're actually able to, to recognize good advice or actually, or at least advice that is not as bad. And so I would, I would really suggest to, to sit down and think and actually understand how your systems work, become a little bit of a hacker, you know, get a little bit of the hacker mindset, spend more time on actually understanding how the internet works, actually understanding how computers work. You don't have to become an expert. You don't have to be able to program, but you should, you should have a bird's eye view of what's actually going on. And after that, you have to stay current. And that combined with maybe knowing somebody who actually can do those last 50% is the only real thing you can do. Right, right. Yeah, that that's uh, you know that mirrors uh, I guess uh, what, what I what I heard from uh, mentioned mentioned his name bef uh, name before Jim Baconic is that's uh, basically you know go through the the trivia method you know grammar learn all the various components of the computer how they work together um, and then uh, you know once you have that basic understanding then you can start to I guess come to uh, maybe not conclusions but um, you you can you can put you can put those things together and come out with uh, with with theories and test them and all that so um, yeah I'm, 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 I, I, th I definitely think people should that's why I, I always prefer um, this this is I, if I'm going to be using a piece of software um, I'll go and research the encryption standard that's in there you know any potential um, downsides that there may be but I know a lot of people don't do that um, but uh, anyway anyway <coughs> I, oh, yeah, um, if you have anything go ahead and step yeah. What you just said, you know, um, knowing the encryption standard that is used in a software, it's actually um, um, something I blame the security industry for, that we go around and brag with our military grade encryption, you know, and say, oh, we're using this algorithm, and we're using this algorithm. The matter of the fact today is that Encryption algorithms are usually not the weak link. And there is a lot of absolute paranoia about the biggest key length and the uh, most recent algorithm, whatever. And uh, people consider that as a, um, as a sign of quality. However, it usually isn't. There are very many people that sell unrealistic products in the sense of they spend a lot of time having the newest and greatest algorithm in there which is completely off base when it comes to the threat model of the user. And it also completely ignores that it is actually the implementation of the algorithm, not the algorithm itself, that is much more meaningful. And that is the protocols and not the, the algorithms that are more meaningful. And that is the overall software quality that is more meaningful than the algorithms used. So. I think there, there are a lot of these uh, rules of thumbs that the security industry has spread to overcome this lack of ability to, to, to see quality. And one of those rules of thumbs is what algorithms are used. And it's a really bad rule of thumb. I mean, I have seen so much shit products, sorry for the words, but mm -hmm. so much shit work, uh, products. They're using the state of the art algorithms with the biggest key length. And the implementations and protocols are just amateurish to, to a degree that was hardly describable. So it is, I mean, I, I, I would like to, to give you a real good solution on everything, you know, and give you straight answers and say, this is what you do. Mm. But my position there is simply, there is no, no such thing as you being able to, to judge that. You, if you're not an expert, you're really lost. I mean, let's face it, you're lost if you're not an expert. And 
the only thing you can kind of do is know the big picture and with that knowledge you might be able to recognize an expert that you trust and then you can say okay i'm going to follow the concrete advice of that expert in my specific case with the information of threat model etc that is basically all you can do right now everything else is dangerous half knowledge yeah yeah, that's uh, that's, un that's understandable. Cer certainly understandable. Uh, like I like I said earlier, this stuff is uh, it's it's not easy. It's not easy at all. So um, I it guess it's not. It uh, is not. Yeah. It is completely not easy. And I mean, um, in in a, in a way, the security industry is at fault there, because we have sold so much snack oil, and it's good business, and you want people to believe that they can make good decisions because that sells um, and so a lot of the fault is with the security industry but the the other issue is it's simply an enormously fluid sector and it's even fluid and almost inconceivable for actual experts and also the requirements of the users are not actually trivial you know it's your requirements might be completely different from my requirements and i'm actually certain that they are but that also means that there's no single way of of um, fulfilling those requirements so in a way we when you're when you're about to buy a car you're spending a lot of time you know talking with a mechanic if that kind of car, you know, goes to the shop a lot or not. Um, you talk to friends who might have that car, you know, and ask them, okay, what, what's your experience with the car? So there's a lot of information gathering we, we do before we actually decide on the car. But when it comes to security products, uh, we basically go to that shady used car salesman and uh, tell him, uh, show me the best car you have, you know? That always goes wrong because he just wants to sell. Mm -hmm. So put as much effort in selecting your computer and your operating your app, uh, operating system and your apps as you put into researching what car you should buy. That is very yeah. That is a uh, very good yeah, general advice. Yeah, I uh, yeah I. Yeah, I like that. Very good, very good. So, um, I guess uh, um, I've got one other uh, one other question here that's not related to, to our discussion tonight, or I don't think it is, at least. Um, but uh, did you have any other uh, general closing thoughts on uh, uh, the, the the fog of crypto war? I think that number one, whatever is happening there right now, is something that might be really dangerous, but it is something that is not fatal. So it's not the end of the world if the state wins this round. You can get away with a lot of stuff even if the state has the upper hand in some technology. Essentially, we've done that forever. You know, in the end, the state can only catch the low hanging fruit. So whatever happens, don't panic and don't give up. Well said. Well said. So, uh, so Smuggler, uh, are you going to be uh, speak, speaking at uh, Hackers Congress again this year? Uh, yes, I will. And actually, I uh, just remembered something, and that is I actually gave a talk about the fog of crypto war at the HCPP two years ago. So that was one more reason to uh, – well, it was the, the use of that, um, of that article, actually. Oh. And yes, I will speak this year as well. Okay. All right. Very good. And that. Uh, and I. I. I'm gonna make it out there sometime. I'm hoping. I'm. My goal is. Uh, my goal is next year. Prague's a, a. A big trip for me. Never been over to Europe. So. So yeah. The. Uh, so Hackers Congress at uh, 2019. It's uh, in Prague, October 4th to 6th. And uh, any. Uh, I guess. I, I'm not sure if. I, I'm pretty sure I'd know if. if well, maybe I wouldn't. But anyway, uh, if any of my listeners are gonna gonna be attending this uh, this conference, uh, any teasers on what you'll be uh, speaking about, or is that uh, under wraps until the event? Um, it is not official yet, and there's no um, officially well-worded title, but <laughs> I can let you in a little bit sure. uh, into this well-kept secret. Um, I'm actually going to talk about 
the state of the art of anonymous digital payment systems that have nothing to do with blockchains. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's uh, it's going to be interesting. Wow, okay. Very good. Well, I hope so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, you've, you've never failed to disappoint, or you know, you've, uh, you never. Well, that's uh, that was a bad way to word that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I never failed on that either. <laughs> you, you get what I mean. You, you, all, you always come and you always yes. deliver great information. Um, but, uh, uh, but yeah, I guess uh, um, if uh, people are, I, I mentioned uh, interplex.net and uh, opaque.link. Uh, is there anything else people want to follow your work? Uh, where can they find you? Um, no, that's the, the main things. I, I always have to be a little bit careful of not mixing my official work and my less official work with my less official identity. So uh, let's keep it with those two. And, sure. Um, I'm also not a big fan of marketing my work uh, within a, a, a podcast. Um, you can research that on, on Twitter if you want to. You can find out uh, one of the companies um, if you really are interested. Okay, understood. Understood. Very good. Well, uh, th thanks a lot for coming on, Smuggler. It was uh, it was fun as it as it was the first time, and uh, yeah, I, have, I guess if uh, if you'd be interested, love love to have you back on uh, whenever another another interesting topic comes to mind. Always, it's always great fun. Thank you for the opportunity. Oh, no problem, no problem at all. Uh, so there you have it, guys. Uh, Smuggler, uh, definitely. As I, I'll, I'll put all, I'll put uh, links in the show notes. Uh, definitely do go uh, go check out uh, you know, all that uh, valuable information that he's uh, that he's offered. Uh, and uh, I mean, go check out the uh, hashtag Agora IRC chat too. It's uh, it's a fun little chat room. Uh, when when there's people there, or there's people there, but it seems like a lot people are AFK AFK some. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, sometimes you can hop hop on there and have some have some interesting conversations. So uh, definitely go check that out. But uh, yeah, I guess that's uh, I guess that's it. Uh, until next time, let's build the agora and let's build second rooms. <laughs>